for inviting me nonetheless. And um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm taking the opportunity on the one hand to, to share some of my newest ideas, but also at the same time to reflect a bit about how it came that I was thinking about the things that I'm thinking about. Um, so I'm I'm sort of, in a sense, applying a bit of my own ideas on my own ideas um, to, to see where it leads. I, I don't think there's, there's much insight in that, it just a, sort of a historical reflection maybe a bit. So like all good stories, my stories start on a dark and unruly night, um, this time in Melbourne in Australia. <clears throat> so in 2009, um, a colleague of mine who was actually my supervisor for my master's um, in translation studies, um, him and I went to the EARTIS conference in, in, in uh, Melbourne in 2009. And because I just started at the university in 2006, I didn't have lots of research funding. So I could only afford a... Um, like um, student accommodation, um, you know, very cheap accommodation. And, and so he decided, okay, he will stay with me in this, um, in this very cheap accommodation. And as luck would, or unluck would have it, about two nights into the conference at three in the morning, some unruly students came in, totally drunk, vomiting all over the passage, sitting against the wall and making a loud noise. And it wasn't brick walls, it was dry walls. So we couldn't sleep. And we, I was a bit upset, but my colleague said, well, we are awake now, let's do some work. So we started reading and as we started reading, we started also talking and he suggested to me, there's this thing, new thing that people talk about complexity. Why don't I take that as a research agenda? Because at that point, I was looking for, um, you know, where, where do I go with my research? So that's where it started on that really crazy, haphazard night. Um, and I started thinking about complexity. And, and um, Professor Kamrat has, has mentioned the book. Um, I linked it at that point to development because I wanted to um force if i can put it um politely um i wanted to force european scholars onto unknown territory for them um in in our um in our field much of the theory comes from global north context and I at some point found it difficult to get my work published um, because of a number of reasons. Probably some of it just wasn't good enough. But there were also, you know, some kinds of, well, your, your English isn't good enough and this isn't good enough and so on. So I wanted to put ideas on the table that people cannot just shoot down. They had to um, take a bit of time to... Um, to think about it. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the at the citations for about the first four or five years, nobody cited the book. So it 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 sort of achieved what I wanted to achieve. In other words, um, linking translation and development studies into issues that are relevant to the African context, the global south context that I that I work in. So it was a bit naughty, um, but there was for me some um, method in my madness. As I was finishing up this 2014 book, I realized that there's a major gap in the book, and that was semiotics. So at some point, I, after I've submitted the, the manuscript, I actually thought about recalling the manuscript and writing about, um, adding parts about semiotics. And then I thought, no, well, I've come this far, let the thing stand, then you write the next book about semiotics. Um, and actually, the initial title of this book would have just been a semiotic theory of translation. And once again, as I was 
finishing up the book, rewriting it for the last time, I realized that I've moved um, quite a bit out of just semiotics and that I've that I've moved moved into biosemiotics quite a bit. But I didn't want to call it a biosemiotic theory because I haven't spent enough time on the biosemiotic foundation. So that's why I add the bio in in brackets and I asked the publisher whether they would be okay with that and they they said it would be okay with it. So um, it seems to me that each time that you write, you think faster than than you write. By the time you've written something, um, you, well, in my case, it's, and, and I will show you that it doesn't always work that way. But in the in this case, um, in these cases, it worked this way. And then in the semiotics um, book, I started thinking about translation in terms of process, in terms of work done, in terms of energy. And that sort of immediately led um, that when I finished the 2019 book, I already had all the ideas or the basic ideas for the, the book that I'm that will be out now in May um, on, on thermodynamics. And I will talk a bit about it um, later. I've sort of in the last six weeks or so, I, I did a bit of wrote another paper where I um, developed that a bit further into semiotic thermodynamics and what, what would thermodynamics mean in semiotic terms, um, trying to 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 bring these make these things a bit clearer. So what next? And I will at the at the very end reflect a bit on that. But I also think my, and I'm saying this specifically if 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 doc, for, for doctoral students, um, that your context I think should drive your interests. Um, for me, all real good scholarship, even very theoretical and abstract scholarship, um, is usually driven by 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 some kind of interest in a context. In, a, in my case, I realized over the past year or two that it's been driven by, by the emergence of South African society after 1994. So you will, will remember that before 1994, South Africa was an, was an apartheid state where, um, sorry, where, where black people and, and people of mixed race um, did not have voting rights and property rights and all these kinds of things. Um, so by 1994, I was 30 and I've lived through a, about 30 years of apartheid. So I had that background. Um, in the 1980s, I started, as I went to university, I started questioning all of this. Then I went through the post-apartheid period and now sort of the, the both the successes and the failures, because there were great successes, but there were also massive failures, and we are we are now battling with some of the failures. And the thing that that really fascinates me is so why do things happen the way that they happen in a society? If you if you sort of assume that in 1994 there was a clean slate, which obviously there wasn't. Um, why, why did some things go well and some things went really badly after 1994? Um, if you want to ask me more about that, we could we could talk about that. I don't want to go into the detail, but just to show that I've, I've been living through news, through changes at the university, through my own personal life. I've been living this emergence or the birth of a new society, and it's a painful thing, and I think that has um, piqued my interest um, in this. So. Um, I'm now going to stop the storytelling and try to explain sort of three broad fields, namely, or not fields, three broad points of interest that, that I had to deal with over the years, if I now look back. So the first would be generally philosophical problems. I will then talk about a few theoretical issues, and then I will close with some uh, methodological issues. Um, so these these hang together, I think, when you when you um, are thinking about 
um, conceptual problems. So the um, my, I, my interpretation is that scholars from the natural and, and social sciences on the one hand, and the humanities on the other hand share two problems, right? So the first one is, how can physical things have non-physical consequences? How can the arrangements of atoms in the ink of on a printed page create something like love in my mind? We hate something like um, expectation. So let's say I receive a letter from my loved one saying, I'm coming home for the weekend. The, the atoms and the way in which they are structured on that letter, the ink atoms, has the, have the effect that I now have an expectation. I'm looking forward to the weekend because my loved one is coming home. So um, can we explain? We, we know it happens. It's, it's not a matter that we don't know that it happens, but can we explain how physical things can have non-physical consequences and implications? Um, and then the other side round, as, as um, Professor Gamrat said, I'm interested in, okay, so now that there are non-physical things, now that there are what Deacon calls absential things, or what we can call ideational things, how can these things change physical systems? How can they have physical consequences? So I can dream up the idea of social justice and then I make it, and we actually use the term, I translate it into policy, I translate it into practice. How does this happen? Um, can we somehow explain these things? So these problems have, have been longstanding problems in Western academic thinking. You will know of this, I'm not gonna spend much time here, um, it, it's, it's been solved by dualism, that mind and matter are two different things and they basically have no relationship to one another. We have then um, physicalism, which is a, um, a form of reducing everything to, to matter or to physicality. And the things that we value, like beauty and, and love and intentions, they just epiphenomena, they, epiphenomena they, they look real, but they, they aren't really real. They just are ways of describing physical processes. So physicalism or material reductionism is, the, is sort of the one end where everything is, is reduced to, to matter. On the other hand, you have idealism where everything is reduced to ideas. And we find this in, in the humanities quite a bit that, well, all they are, is our ideas um, and our ideas have actually very little relationship to, to reality. We just deal with our ideas and we don't worry about the matter from which these things come. Um, there's also neutral monism as a, as a, as a um, option to solving this problem, um, but you can go and have a look at it. It's not, it's not a, a very strong one. So, if you then have to ask, if, if, if I'm rejecting what came before, and it's not only me, I think there are many scholars at this point rejecting the reductionisms of that, that we were, that we grew up with, what is the alternative? And I think the alternative is what one would call emergentism. Um, it has a history of about 150 years. Um, but it's a it's a way of saying um, you cannot reduce or, or it's it's not useful to reduce reality to one aspect of it. Rather, what you want to explain is how more complex um, and more intricate systems emerge from simpler ones. So at first, you um, ten billion years ago, there were no ideas. I mean, there probably wasn't even an Earth. Right, but in, even in the universe, there were no ideas. It was only energy and matter. Um, then, at some point, life emerged from that. At some point, intelligent life emerged from that. In some point, at some point, um, human life with with its linguistic abilities emerged from that. So, what what I'm trying to um, think about is a process where we apply this line of thinking also to cultures and societies that um, 
what is make possible what can become makes possible what is what is next and i will i will show you some um, some more about that later so this emergentism idea and complexity idea has been very strong in the in the natural sciences and i think and and that is why i wrote the the book that i'm that, that should be published in may is that we need a response from the humanity side um we 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 quite often moan that the natural sciences don't understand us um, and that there's no debate between us. And I think part of the problem is that, that um, we need to respond and we need to say, okay, this is how we understand it as humanity scholars. And this is what we put on the table concerning this debate. Um, so the natural sciences do have um, good ideas about this, but it's from their perspective. And what I think is what, what we need to do and what I'm trying to do is to write about things like thermodynamics and energy and information from a humanities perspective. And I want to be clear, I'm not using thermodynamics as a metaphor. I want to use thermodynamics in exactly the same way that a physicist would use it, but applied to semiotic material. And that's the that's the, the question that, that is really difficult to answer. Um, I have some ideas and I've made some suggestions, but I don't think the question has been answered fully yet. Um, so if, if we were to add our voices as humanity scholars to, to this debate for a, for a kind of a unified approach to reality, what would that, what would that be? Um, in the humanities, the, the response has, has usually um, diverted along or, or has been diverted to uh, along two lines. So on the one hand, you have realism, and there was at some point quite naive views about realism, which, which we don't, um, very few people ascribe to today. Um, but the dominant response I think has been idealism and constructivism, which are not bad ideas in themselves. But the problem is that constructivism and idealism actually makes nature the problem quite often. Um, so it, it, it wants to cut out matter and energy out of our thinking. It sometimes wants to cut out biology, um, for instance, in gender debates. Um, there, there, there are efforts to say, okay, let's let's ignore biology in total because biology is the is the bad guy here, or the the bad idea here. Let's let's have our ideas about things dominate matter, and I think there's this this solid reason for an argument like that. I just think it's been taken too far, and it had the implication that we ignored materiality. Um, especially after the demise of Marxism, there was very, um, after 1990, there was very little reason for people to, to for scholars in the humanities to think ma about matter. Um, since then, neomaterialism has, has, has um, become an important um, play in the field. Um, I think my work sort of falls within the bracket of neomaterialism, although I, I think some of the claims are too radical. I'm still trying to work out exactly what I think about them. I think also the ecological crisis has shown us what happens if our ideas are not aligned to the matter and energy on which they are built. It means that we extract too much and that we actually then destroy the, the, the material basis in which, we, in which we exist. So is there a way to, to, to create a view where both matter and what matters um, in other words, matter and meaning can be handled into one approach. And then where do we start? I think a good starting point would be information. So if we take um, Gregory Bateson's argument that information is a difference that makes a difference. I think it, it gives us a little foothold into linking matter, energy and meaning. Because the first difference is clearly for Bateson matter and energy. It is a difference that you can observe. It is something that has been caused by um, 
matter and energy. But the makes a difference is value, meaning, usefulness, aboutness, significance, all these kind of essential things that, that we talk about. So um, I'm going to basically take Bateson and link Bateson and Deacon and then see if we can get a kind of a synthesis out of, out of this. Um, but the, the point is that if we want to talk about matter energy, we need to take one step back, and that is talk about thermodynamics, um, which is the science that explains energy. So if there's a difference, that difference has been caused, which means there was an energy um, working, and we need, to, we need to try to understand that. Right, so those are the, the basically philosophical, um, some of the philosophical issues that I try to think about. Theoretically, then, um, I'm going to take you through sort of two major steps that I've been thinking about. So the one would be the 2019 book, um, just to show you how I started thinking about translation. And then I will, I will um, go to the new book to, to see how that played into thermodynamics. So the, the, the question of the 2019 book, I think, was this question, what is translation? Um, and I answered the question at that point by saying that translation is process. We need to think about process first. I don't say process only. Um, and um, if I formulated it as process only, then I was wrong. My intention was always process first. And, I, and, and, and let's say the sedimentation or the form taking of process Second, so the pro the problem that we need to explain in translation is not change. Um, remember, in translation studies, the question is how do you change a source text into a target text? And sure, it it I think it is a it is a valid question, but I think there's more to it because the first thing that you have to answer is how did any form come about? How did a source text come about? A source text or an incipient sign is, is part of an already existing process. So I think we, 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 um, we need to think more in terms of processes. Then I think we need to realize that those processes are clearly semiotic processes. So they are purely physical processes. They are purely energetic processes. Um, I'm excluding them here. Um, you would know that there's a debate about pan-semiotism and pan-psychism and so on. Um, I am not 100% sure about my position, but for now, I don't follow those. Um, I draw the line. I, I assume a kind of line between um, matter energy and semiotic processes. And we can debate that. I know there are good arguments to both sides. Right. So then I also um, said that translation is a complex process. Right? And by complex, I mean what I explained to you about emergence um, just a while ago. So it is translations emerge through complex semiotic processes. Every translation has a history, has an um, emergent trajectory. And that's why the, the, the title of the last book is Trajectories of Translation. So I'm looking at, at historical um, emergences. Um, and also, it is a semiotic process because um, it is now matter that is subject to absential constraints. So typically, when you have, when you think about matter and anything in matter that, that, that emerges, it is caused by other matter and by other systems of, of matter. What we are dealing with in semiotic systems is that there are now constraints that are not material in themselves, such as expectations or hopes, which now drive the materiality of my body. Um, and um, so we, we, we need to find ways to think about those. I, I then um, conceptualize translation 
in terms of neck entropy. Now, um, to, to quickly explain, so the second law of thermodynamics says that all of reality is subject to um, entropy. If left to its own, everything will come to a standstill, everything will die, there will be everything will be at the same level of energy, right? Neck entropy is therefore the work that it, that needs to be done to counter that entropy. So for me, translation is a neck entropic semiotic process um, in which semiotic work is performed um, on any kind of material. Um, and this work is done through constraints. And I will explain that um, a bit more. So actually, this conceptualization was in the 2019 book, but it was this conceptualization that drove me to write the, the book that I'm that should be com coming out now. Because if you say, if you talk about neck entropic processes, if you talk about constraints, then you need some theory of thermodynamics to explain that um, with. I, I did a bit of work on categories. If, if somebody has specific questions about that, we can talk about that. Um, I'm not sure how successful it is. I, I spoke about using the Persian categories of representament, object, and interpretant, that you can get translation processes that start with the representament or that's focused on the representament or start and is focused on the object or start and is focused on interpretants, whether that is useful. Um, I'm not yet sure. The next question then is how is translation? Well, I think it the implication is that translation is necessarily a semiotic process, but not necessarily linguistic. Right? It has to be some form of meaning making, but it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to include language. Um, and I think it would include things uh, such as um, listening to a piece of music and making a painting out of that, right? Um, that doesn't mean that language probably in the process doesn't play a role when I'm thinking about it, but it also doesn't mean that it, there has to be some linguistic link because it could be at the, at the pre-linguistic level, my, my sort of um, phenomenological experience of the um, of the music. Um, I think translation always works in this way that there are multiple, um, and I've used the terms incipient and subsequent because of the link to thermodynamics, which, which is always linked to time, right? So it's not, a, it's not a source, it's a first sign for a particular process, then you have a subsequent sign for, a, for another um, process. But there are always multiple signs. So just think of Shakespeare. Um, if I want to translate Shakespeare from English into Afrikaans, for instance, Shakespeare himself is the, Shakespeare's work himself is the consequence of previous translational processes. So that you can already identify a number of sources that influenced um, Shakespeare. And in the same way, my reading of Shakespeare is in, is influenced by my um, interpretation, which which becomes um, which is another which is another influence on this on this subsequent sign. So there are there are multiple signs to start with, and there are multiple signs after the end. Um, my talking about my translation of Shakespeare is another subsequent sign of that translation process. Um, semiotic work is always done under pragmatic constraints. Um, I think, um, and I think people will, will know this, I don't think this is, this is totally novel, but I, I think the point is that translational processes from a certain perspective are all the same. It's the translation of one meaning into another meaning. Exactly how it happens, each case is, is determined by the pragmatic constraints. If the pragmatic constraints are that of literature writing or literature translation, then it happens in a certain way. If the pragmatic constraints are legal translation, it happens in another way. 
if the pragmatic constraint is um, paint me a copy of myself or paint me um, artistic rendition of myself, you have different pragmatic constraints that determine how the semiotic work is being done. Um, translation is also such that I think all signs are translatable for the very simple reason that once something is a sign, there's nothing else that you can do with it but to translate it. Um, it's not as if signs can mean without translation. It's not that signs have meaning before translation. The only meaning of a sign is its translation into another sign. So in that sense, all signs are translatable um, independent of the case. I think the, 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 the um, one of the insights that I think is um, maybe taking us a bit forward, but probably not, not in an uncomplicated way, is the idea that, that actually what we translate is patterns of constraints. We don't translate matter. I think that we will all agree about that. But also, it's difficult to say that we translate meaning, because what is meaning? Meaning is that kind of interrelationship between matter, the constraints that operate on the matter, and my inference about the relevance of that of those constraints. Um, so I don't think I've worked this out well enough yet, but but my my argument at this point is that what we actually translate are systems or patterns of constraints. Um, translation and, and, and interpretation, I think in this line of thought, and if you want more detail about it, I can also talk more about it in question time, but it's, it's translation and interpretation for me are two very closely related parts of the same process. We can perhaps distinguish between them, or maybe we shouldn't, I'm not yet exactly sure. But what happens in this whole process is that we are talking about inference. In other words, what, what significance do we infer from the matter in front of us? If there's a loud bang, I infer some significance. If there's a soft whispering, I infer some significance. So um, it's, it's always a process of trying to determine for me as, as a living organism what is the significance for, of, of the matter for me? Where is the translation? I would argue that nothing under the sun, and oh, I would, with the modern worldview, obviously above the sun, is a translation only. Um, think about a novel. A novel is not a translation. It's a translated novel. Um, a movie is not translated from the book or adapted from the book. It is an adapted movie or a translated movie. A news bulletin is not a translation. It is a translated piece of news, right? So translation, um, so let, uh, let me put it this way. All semiotic things have this translational aspect to them. It's not a matter that they are as a, as, ex, as existent or that they are as inherent translations. They are things that have been, that have emerged through a translation process. So they have a translational dimension to them, which we can then study. So I don't, I, I don't think it's, um, it's wise to try to convince news writers that they are translators and that what they produce are translations. They obviously translate, and it, they, they obviously give um, um, translations, translated texts, but I don't think we need to claim that everything is a translation. Um, there are many things that have translational aspects, right? So the translation is in a building. Um, let's say the Sydney State Opera. Um, what is the, of what would that building be a translation? Um, I can look at it from the outside and say, well, it's the sales of ships. Um, 
or it's the idea of freedom in the wind, um, whatever I want to want to see in it. Um, translation is in farms, the way in which people um, plow their lands, in which they see, sow their seeds, in which they deal with the animals. There's translational aspects in that. There's translational aspects in research lab. Latour has written a lot about, about that. For you as, as music specialists in concert halls, in sports stadiums, there are translations. So translations, as um, Piotr Blumchinski, who is um, originates from your country, works in, in, in um, Ireland now, has written a book about ubiquitous translation. Translations, um, translational processes take, take place everywhere. So why am I talking about thermodynamics? Um, I'm talking about thermodynamics because um, I said in 2019 that translation is work performed. And work to be performed needs energy. And thermodynamics is the field of study that works with energy, right? Um, you will know that per se, the meaning of, its sign, of a sign is its translation. So that's an activity that happens. It's work that is performed on a set of signs. Um, so I've explained to you that for work, you need energy and for energy, you need thermodynamics. And if it is true that matter and energy and mind and idea are entangled, then it means we should be able to talk about the thermodynamics of ideas and societies and cultures. I've just recently read a paper of which I understood very little, but it was they, they were able to, to quantify the amount of energy that each synapse in the brain need when firing once. So if you have that, and you can start, let's say, somebody to think about a certain topic, you can literally start thinking about the energy that is needed to think about a certain topic. Um, and whether that is useful or not, um, I'm not sure. That would be a typical physicist perspective on this. I'm trying more to think of it in a qualitative way from a, from a humanities perspective. Right. So in short, if all of reality is subject to the second law of thermodynamics, that means that culture and societies are also subject to the to the um, um so we we accept these days that that reality is matter and energy. Therefore, I talk about matter energy all the time. I don't want to say what is matter and what is energy. I'm not a physicist physicist. And I didn't want to talk about. Um, the physical things, um, because then I need to explain it in a physical, in a physicist terminology. So that's why I kept the general term. So if we include energy in our equation, it means that we have to think of reality um, not in terms of substance, but in terms of processes of creating substance, which is what Barat calls sedimentation. So you have you have process, you have flow, and then that flow tends towards a habit, a pattern, a gradient, or a tendency, which is then your, your sedimentation. So um, these two things are, I think, entwined one into the other. Um, I think it's important to understand that energy is not something. Energy is the relationship between two states, two physical states, right? So if you have two physical states that are at different levels of entropy, then you have energy. So think about this. You have a bathtub with 50 liters of water, but it's plugged. Um, this, this water theoretically could do work, but for the moment, it does no work because it's in equilibrium, right? Everything, there, there are no waves on the water. It just still, it's quiet. We call it, it's in equilibrium. Now, if you pull the plug, then there's a difference between the pressure of, um, on, on top of the water and the, and the pressure at the bottom where the, where the plug flows out. Now, water will flow out. And because there's a difference between the, the pressure in the pipe and the pressure on the bath, on, on the water on, in the bath, you now have energy that can be used. For instance, if you put a little turbine in your, in your bath, exhaust, um, it could give you some 
electricity to, to, to charge your cell phone. So the point about energy is that energy isn't something. Energy is the difference between two somethings. And that difference can be used to do work. Um, and I try to do this by linking information, thermodynamics, which explain energy, and to semiosis, which explains meaning. So if you if you take information as, as the, the, let's say, the starting point, you can talk about the energy of information, and you can talk about the meaning of information. And that is that is the link that bring these things together in one framework, if I can call it that. Information, just like energy, is in something. Information isn't a substance, right? Let's think back to Bateson. Information is a difference that makes a difference, right? So information is a relationship between two sets of matter energy. So the first the first difference in Bateson is material. There's a material difference that makes a difference, which is an essential difference. So the, it's what we are looking at information is the implications or the effects of matter and energy differences that we can that we can look at. Um, I'm going to try to to link it together in a in a moment. So Deacon um, says that information has syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, right? So the syntax of any information has been defined by Shannon. That's a carrying capacity um, and the entropy of any material system that, that can convey energy. The semantics of, in, of um, information has been called Boltzmann information because Boltzmann has shown how one physical system can be about another. Let's quickly explain. Um, if we take our bathtub again, let's say you come into a bathroom, it's extremely cold. The air in the bathroom is extremely cold. There's water in the bath, you touch the water, the water is hot. So there's a difference between these two systems. The fact that there's a difference says, that somebody must have heated this water. It couldn't have been the surroundings that heated the water. So the, the one system is actually, in that sense, being about the other one. Sometimes it could be caused by, or it could just mean that there must be another reason for why it is the way it is. But um, systems are physically could be said to be about one another. And then there's the, the pragmatic side of of information, which Deacon calls the Darwin information. So what happens here is that the inside and the outside of an organism, right? So you have an organism, its inside is coupled to another system outside of it. Interpret the Boltzmann information, right? So if I, as a living organism, can see a difference in my environment, I can interpret that difference as, as being the reference to something else. And I could infer meaning. So if I can see, if I'm a lion, uh, no, let's say if I'm a gazelle and I observe a difference between the grass and something else, I could make the inference that this is a lion. I could make the inference that there's danger and I could run away. So in terms of Percy and semiotics, I think it roughly works like this. The representament, just gives us the carrying capacity. In Peirce's terms, that is only the, the possibility, the potential meaning that we can work with. The object gives us the reference. So to what does the representament refer? It is It refers to the object, and it gives us a reference based on the constraints that we've observed. And from that, we form the interpretant by saying, okay, what is the relevance? of the object, which I've observed through the representament, what is the relevance of that for me? Do I need to run? Do I need to hide? Can I eat? Should I avoid? Um, and all the other zillions of cultural things that we do with meaning. So I think in this kind of Persian line, we get a synthesis between information, energy, 
and significance. And they are, they are related in this um, way of thinking. But that gives us a second move. And that is how to explain how we, we now know that the interpretants, the significances, come from the way in which a, a living organism interprets, infers the relevance of material systems um, around it, right? So that's how mind emerges from matter. Um, the question now is, how does mind constrain, how does it play back into matter? How can ideas um, have an influence on matter? And to do that, we have to explain how ideas themselves can become constraints. Um, how significance can be objectified or materialized and hence be a constraint. Because the problem here is that it's, it's virtually impossible to explain how non-material things can have material effects if you want to do a, just a logical analysis, right? So we need to find a different way of explaining it here. Um, so I'll start by, by positing the membrane as the precondition for any significance. So before there were membranes around cells, there probably were no significance because the membrane creates a cut between me as an organism and my environment. And that is necessary to be able to, to determine the implications of my environment. If I and my environment are the same thing, there's no need for, to, to, to interpret um, significance. So multicellular organisms, they need two sets of, of communicative ability. On the one hand, they, 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 the cells internally need to be able to communicate. The brain with the legs, the stomach with the uh, mouth, um, et cetera, et cetera. But you also, as a living organism, you also need to communicate with your environment. Um, and this we usually do through our sense organs. We receive um, signals from outside, um, rays of light on our, on our eyes, sound waves on our ears, chemicals on our mouth, in our nose, pressure on our, on our skins, right? So the, the, the next step, I think, after the, um, after the membrane that is really important is the emergence of a nervous system, and specifically a central nervous system. So in, a, in, a, in organisms with a central nervous system, you have a brain, or we can even say a brain body, in other words, brain and body that can um, perform, um, if you have humans that can perform language. So you have this emergence from, from very simple stimulus response in, 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 in monocellular um, organisms to really complex metacognition in, in human beings. Um, this is shown in, in Sharoff and, and um, Tennyson's book, 21, 2021 book, where um, they say that, that any living organism, and in this case they're talking about the human, basically consists of three aspects. Um, I don't think they would call it three parts, but there are three aspects to it. So you have the bodily um, aspect. If you look from right back to left, you will see right, you have the, the most, the smallest parts, um, DNA, etc. Then you have cells, then you have tissues, and then on the left-hand side, you have organ, um, organs. And at the very left, you have the, the, the whole body. But that body also has cognitive abilities. And these are perceptual abilities, um, integrating abilities and effecting abilities. And the important thing here is, I think, is the effecting and the integrating abilities. So our brains are able to integrate perceptual information with memory information in a way that can activate our bodies. You know, the finger there, the leg, the boy drinking some or eating something I can't clearly see. So our, our, our cognitive composition is linked to our 
embodied our bodies, which mean that this becomes one system and that uh, what we what we um, think about can have effect on through this integrating system can have effect on our muscles and, and how we do things. And that then includes also the niche, um, which is our environment and the artifacts that we created, the information and the social structures um, that we have. So the, the, the point here is that with language, cognition can actually be objectified in humans. Um, so each writing or audio recording um, or video recording is an example of language that is being objectified. Um, so first you have cognition, thinking that is objectified in language, and then you have a next step, language that is objectified in writing, audio recordings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you also the the extended mind hypothesis also tell us that we we distribute our cognition in the whole body, and we distribute it between bodies, and we strip, distribute it into our environment which gives us something like this. We now have networks of what I would call objectified cognition. In other words, networks of language, networks of artifacts. The, the buildings in that city is, is a network of objectified cognition. It, it carries in it patterns of thinking about reality, about building, about being safe, about being human, et cetera, et cetera. Our practices, our social structures, all of these, then means that significance itself becomes a constraint. Um, and that's why we can then say that translation is indeed negentropic work. So what you do in translational processes is you constrain matter, energy, in order to share some significance, to create new significances, to modify them, to manipulate um, significance. Um, so I think what you have is some kind of an entangled relationship between matter energy on the one hand and our ideas. And um, it's most of the time when you observe the one like with 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 um, the the wave and and particle function of of light, if you observe one, the other one tends to disappear. If you observe the matter, the significance tends to disappear, and if you observe the significance, the matter tends to to disappear. But they are both there at the same time. Um, so for me, culture at any moment is an entropic, sedimented state of a material energy cognitive process. So we have this complex process of our bodies and our minds working together. And through that, we create culture. Um, exactly how semiotic work differs from physical work, in other words, intentionality, um, that is still a, a, a problem that, that I am working on, on, on how to exactly explain that. So I think in the end, we have what, what um, Michael Cronin calls some kind of a troposphere in which matter and mind are entangled. So you start with energy and matter, out of that emerge life, out of that emerge significance. That significance became objectified and distributed in the, in the troposphere and that objectified and distributed significance can now also constrain matter, which means that the process runs back and forth um, at pretty much the same time, which gives us a nice little cloud um, of a sphere, a troposphere, as Michael Cronin suggested. The last part I quickly want to reflect on is a bit of methodology. So the problem is that if we if we think radically historically or in terms of thermodynamics, in other words, thermodynamic processes emerge in one direction only, unless you you perform work on them, but they they emerge in one in one direction only. So 
what 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 I was looking for is is a kind of methodology which is sensitive to to when I analyze things sensitive to both structure and process or structure and contingency. And my question is so with all of the many things I've said above, what do they mean when we start thinking about causality in in social cultural terms? Um, so I've I've followed um, um, uh, two sociologists, Burn, David Byrne, and 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 Callahan is the co-author, and then also. Malcolm Williams is also a British sociologist who, who said, well, culture and society is such that you can never understand them from one study only. You need to take a complexity approach. You need to have comparable cases. You need to build sets of data which you can then compare to see um, what, what happens with it. So, and and then he, he, he would they would argue that cases are in themselves complex systems, which are nested in or have nested in them, um, and intersect with other complex systems. So, you when you, when you do deal with culture, it's actually like the old saying goes: um, turtles all the way down. It's it's complex systems all the way down. You never get to a point where you can now say, "Okay, I've, I've reached the ground." Um, it's just systems upon systems, systems of meaning making um, nested in other systems. Now, nesting does not necessarily mean hierarchy. Hierarchy, we, we can talk about that further also, but it, I, I'm not seeing it here as meaning hierarchical. I'm just seeing that the one requires the other um, for its existence. So trajectories then are the histories of a case. So what I like, to do then is to study, to take something that has happened in social cultural life and study its history, how it happened, to be able to, to say something about why did it happen this way and not another way. Um, and you, what you're typically going to look at is the points where, where a trajectory changes and try and see if you can at that point think about some influence that, that caused it to change. I think at this point that the ideas that we have in the humanities about causality is still too much influenced by natural sciences and probably too strong. So I'm actually using ideas from natural sciences to counter this idea about strong causality. In, in physics, there's a, a concept known as the adjacent possible, which means that if you take at this moment reality around you, in the next moment, only certain things can happen. And that is called, the, or certain things are more likely to happen than others. And that is called the adjacent possible or the next possible. In other words, the, the idea is that um, reality is emerging over time, and each moment in time makes possible the next moment in time. So let's quickly take an example. If I drive a car at 100 kilometers per hour, the, the adjacent possible in, second, in one second after that would be maybe 110 kilometers per hour. But the chances of me driving 2,000 kilometers per hour in the next second is virtually nothing, right? I could be going at zero, but that means that I would then have hit a, a solid wall. And it can happen, but it's also less possible. So the adjacent possible is everything that is possible based on what is now. Now, this led um, some scholars to... to, to um, and particularly um, Malcolm Williams, to term, coin the term propensities. So um, Williams would say that things happen because they can, because it is possible for them to happen, 
they happen. So because there is a propensity for them to happen in society, that's why they happen. They're not caused um, in the sense that this thing causes that. Rather, what you have is a set of things that interact, that work together to create the propensity. Um, and propensity here means probably something like higher probability, right? Or tendency for, for some things to happen rather than, than other things. Um, and I've used this in the in the new book um, as, as a form of soft causality um, that, that gives us, that doesn't say anything was caused by anything else necessarily, but just that some things happened because there was the possibility and and the existing state of affairs sort of tended in that direction. So this is what they would call a trajectory. So on the left-hand side, you have five lines, right? Um, the, 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 the red and the yellow line are sort of parallel. They move in this pretty much in the same direction, but not in exactly the same place. Then you have the little green line, mm, not as long as the others. Then you have the purple and the blue line moving across them. So if you start comparing those five trajectories, you could probably come up with a right-hand one and says, generally speaking, the trajectory of this composer's interest is X, Y, and Z. It seems that his, his work has is moving in that direction. But be, to be able to do that, you need to have a number of trajectories that you can compare to be able to make this argument. Um, what I've... What I've also tried to do is to say, um, to use this three little arrows and say you have, to, so that they're all part of trajectory one, right? So they're part of the same trajectory, they move in the same direction, but not exactly in the same way. The one happens after the other one, they take the, the, the trajectory 1.2 takes trajectory 1.0 a bit further and, and so on. Um, so what you, what you have is that you can, you can describe the history of things in terms of these tendencies um, and how the, the one tendency leads to another tendency. If you want to go into a really complex um, explanation, you could have something like this, where, where the, the, the bottom trajectory 1.1, 1, 1. 1, 1. 1.2 um, is just a normal line, a normal trajectory. Um, it could, after 1.1, diverge in different directions, um, or it could just continue the way it would. But you could also have, at the end of trajectory 1.1, something could happen and, and, let's say, derail the whole trajectory and take it into the, into the direction of um, trajectory 2. So what I'm thinking about here is, is um, literally the history of something and trying to pinpoint um, patterns over time, trajectories over time, that might um, that might be insightful. And to have the ability at certain points to to say, here yeah, I can see a change in direct direction. In trajectory and 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 I'm I'm trying to think about what could cause that and that's where the propensities then come in. What what were the current situation that made possible or that directed the trajectory into another direction? So I'm going to close with what next. So you find me in a spot, colleagues, where for the first time since that dark and unruly night in 2009, I don't know what to do next. Um, I have no clear sense of what now. There are many things um, in, my, in my mind, um, but I don't really know what to do next. And I've, I've thought about it. Perhaps this is it. Perhaps. I've said what I had to say, and this is it now. Um, I, I don't want to publish just for the sake of publishing. Um, I mean, luckily, I am moving towards the end of my career. So um, for, for, for young people, it's, it's much more difficult. 
Um, but unless there is something that I want to say, that I think that I have to say, I I don't just want to publish um, for no good reason. Um, so in 2014, after the complexity book was published, I visited um, one of my old philosophy lecturers and um, to thank him for the advice that he gave me when, when writing the book. And so I, I, um, he, was, he was gracious and he said, um, you know, congratulations, publishing a book is a big deal. Um, and so, and I said to him, yes, but we'll, uh, we'll first have to see if people are going to read it. And then he quoted, he, he said this thing to me, he said, you have high expectations of life. You don't only want to publish books, you want people to read them. Now, this was his sort of um, satirical way or cynical way to look at, at publications and, and you know, um, what is the important thing? Is it that, that, you, that you say what you want to say or is it that people agree with you? Um, to this day, I don't really know. But so um, actually, um, I, I think once one has, one has said what you want to say, the, the rest is out of your hands. Whether people are going to read it and like it and use it, um, that's out of your hands. And, and it's, always, it's always nice to see it being used, um, but it's not something that you can control. So there are some op options I've thought about linking my work in the next move to critical theory and not hermeneutics philosophy, maybe the new materialism thing. I've thought about linking it more to complexity thinking again, maybe going back to purse, maybe just doing empirical work for a while. And then I've sort of realized also that most of what I've done, I don't think is, is original. Um, it is just synthesizing existing things, bringing, bringing things that already exist um, together. Um, in other words, for instance, the, the complexity thing and, the, and, and development thing, how um, they've been there. Um, it was just putting them together. So quite often, it seems to me that um, in my own work that that this kind of synthetic um, angle dominates. And, and as I say, I, I'm not sure um, what next, um, but that's for us all to see. Um, with that, thank you very much um, for the for the for your attention and for the invitation. And um, I I'll gladly um respond to any questions or comments criticism that you might have um it's always enriching thank you very much <laughs>